Yarostan's Ninth Letter Dear Sophia, Your letter was as painful to read as it must have been to write. How can everything be over? How can workers without illusions about unions march back to work, hailing their unions' victories? How can a population that just woke up be back asleep? We've been hearing rumors of an imminent invasion of tanks massing at our borders, but those rumors disturb us infinitely less than the knowledge that normal life has resumed in your part of the world. We had begun to take it for granted that our fellow human beings in other parts of the globe were engaged in acts similar to our own. The council office in the commune, the occupied research center, the spreading general strike, had all become part of the geography of our world. You couldn't have shocked us more if you had told us a continent had sunk. I was fascinated by Sabina's accounts and interpretations, but I have to admit that I was shocked by her attitude to Titus Zebrun. She treats him as George Alberts's confederate and as her enemy. When Myrna and Yara read your letter, they both acted as if their worst suspicions about Titus were confirmed, and they both subjected me to an extremely humiliating experience when I refused to join them in their condemnation of Titus. Both Yasna and I were so disturbed by Sabina's and your suggestions that we felt compelled to confront Titus directly. We learned that many of the facts Sabina revealed are true, but both Yasna and I are convinced that Sabina's totally negative attitude to the man is unjustified. So much has happened here since Myrna and Yara returned from their excursion that I don't really know where to begin. The eagerness with which they greeted Sabina's revelations about Titus is due mainly to the fact that they seem to have argued with Yasna about Titus during their trip. Despite their enthusiasm about the excursion, the first thing Myrna and Yara talked about when they returned was Yasna's determination to marry Titus. Myrna told me indignantly, Yasna seems set on destroying herself. Can you imagine what that man told her when she expressed admiration for Louisa, Vera, and me? Those three women, he told her, don't deserve anyone's admiration, and certainly not yours. He then called all three of us shameless individualists who put their own personal satisfaction above the, above the interests of their class. What was Yasna's response, I asked. She didn't defend a single one of those women. She proposed to him. She told Yara and me that Titus said such mean things only because he's so lonely and isolated. She said as soon as she took him on an excursion like the one we were on, as soon as he saw what people were doing today, he'd stop being so bitter and contemptuous toward those women. But I don't believe it. Myrna, are you sure you aren't condemning Titus for having attitudes that you've only recently shed? I asked. During the first two years after my release, all you ever told Yara was, stay out of trouble. Until your plan went on strike, you seemed unable to imagine why anyone would want to go on strike. Zednik even found reason to accuse you of being your own jailer. I'm sure Yasna is right. Titus will surely change when he realizes the extent of the changes taking place around him. Why are you so, de de so defensive about him? Myrna asked me. Another thing he told Yasna was that Vera Krenna isn't really in love with that Pavarshan man, but with his wife. That detail must have fascinated Yara. It did, Myrna told me, but Titus didn't tell Yasna that in order to fascinate Yara. He told it in order to prove that Vera wasn't really a proletarian, but a selfish individualist. Somewhat exasperated, I shouted, Vera Krenna is not a proletarian. She's one of the leading bureaucrats in this country. You seem determined on fitting whatever Titus said into Yara's picture of him as Vesna's murderer. Myrna's response to my exasperation was, an excursion would also do you a lot of good, Yarostan. The first result of my defense of Titus was that Yara and Myrna told me very little about their trip. I did learn that such, such excursions are not an isolated phenomenon. Myrna and her friends ran into other workers' delegations wherever they went, and all of them seemed to have been engaged in a similar search. Until your letter came, it seemed as if the human species were suddenly making a deliberate effort to discover itself, to explore the possibilities for starting anew. I also took part in this activity, although on a more limited scale, and my impressions were similar to theirs. I accompanied a delegation of carton plant workers to two other factories, and, contrary to what I told you in my last letter, the specifications for efficient cart carton production were neither my main interest nor that of my fellow delegates. The discussion of cartons was quickly displaced by questions about each other, about our intentions, our analysis of our potentialities, and our means. I also found certain things that disturbed me, both in Myrna's and Yara's brief account, and among the workers I visited, I've often mentioned Yara's fascination with some of the leading bureaucrats. This seems to be extremely widespread. I met many workers who described reforms as enthusiastically as strikes comparable to the one that broke out at Myrna's plant, and who praised reformist bureaucrats even while they were describing the possibilities of doing without them. This inability to distinguish the realization of one's own desires from the victory of the representatives of everyone's desires 
is particularly ominous in view of the disaster you've just described. The willingness on the part of so many people to continue letting themselves be represented obviously allows the representatives of everyone's liberation to remain at the head of a movement that seems to be on the verge of ending the history of representatives. Politicians with imagination, like our acquaintance, Vera Krenna, have been very agile, not only at keeping themselves from being dislodged, but increasing their own power. Krenna has very successfully used an anti-political movement, a movement which is undermining the power of bureaucrats, to increase her own status and power. During the past week, her wing of the bureaucracy accomplished a feat comparable to the puppet show in which you and I took part 20 years ago. A week ago today, Vera Krenna and several other members of the reform wing replaced several leading conservatives in important government posts. The hypocrisy of the slogans with which this feat was justified is comparable to that of the slogans we helped produce during the days you no longer remember so fondly. Vera was far less dishonest in the speech Yasna and I heard several months ago when she had spoken of the need to democratize the bureaucracy by giving more power to people like herself. During last week's events, when she finally acquired that power, she made public statements similar to those she had made during the radio broadcast I described to you. Quote, it is not our aim to establish the iron dictatorship of a stratum of parasites, but to pave the way for the self-government of the producers, she said, accepting a government portfolio. Among other accomplishments so far, the new bureaucrats have passed resolutions favoring the right to strike and the abolition of censorship, namely favoring activity that has been taking place for months. Another acquaintance of ours, Mark Glavney, has been demoted as a result of the recent coup. He is now a fourth secretary instead of a second secretary. The day after Myrna and Yara returned from their trip, a vast demonstration took place, or rather a celebration of the victory of the reformist politicians. Almost all of the carton plant's office workers and most of the production workers took part in this demonstration. Myrna and Yara went too. I stayed home. Your letter hadn't come yet, but that day I already felt as if our former condition were being restored while we waved flags and shouted victory. The feeling was reinforced by what happened the following day. The radio announced that an extraordinary session of the heads of our military organization of all the fr fraternal countries surrounding ours had been held. It was announced that the fraternal countries were surrounding ours with four million soldiers armed with the most modern weapons, including I forget how many tanks. This, amounts, this announcement is clearly a threat of invasion, an ultimatum. Either reestablish authority in a situation which, in Glavny's words, threatens to get out of control, or else authority will be reestablished by four million armed brothers, one for every three members of the population, including children, old people, the disabled. Probably a ratio of two armed brothers to every worker, a hundred tanks to every rifle. Since we refuse to heed Comrade Glavny's counsel not to allow ourselves to, quote, get out of control, we will have to be, quote, liberated militarily for the second time by the same, quote, liberators. By demoting Glavny, the reformers seem to be more intelligent than he at implementing his own project. If this population is to be brought back, quote, in control without tanks and liberation armies, this can no longer be done under the leadership of comrades like Glavny, but it can still be done under the leadership of reformers whose slogans refer to the most radical acts. Apparently, the fraternal allies fear that this population is so far out of control that neither the conservatives nor the reformers will be able to reinstitute re order. Their fear is, of course, my hope. What I hope is that the demonstrations of solidarity with politicians like Vera Krenna are not renunciations of the willingness to move further, but, for, but confused affirmations of the desire for a society that doesn't need politicians. I still think my hope is more than an empty wish. On the, among the people I've spoken to, even those who were unreservedly enthusiastic about the reformers' governmental victory looked forward to more than the reestablishment of order, decorated by the slogans of a revolution that failed to take place. I'm still convinced that the people around me want more than the seizure of power by their comrades, their union, their revolutionary tribunes. Maybe I'm nursing an illusion, but I'm convinced that below the enthusiasm for revolutionary demagogues, there's an undercurrent of desires which are seeking gratification, desires which cannot be vicariously satisfied, which cannot be carried by politicians the way programs can be carried. My own education in political schools has not done much to help me understand this undercurrent. But Myrna's and Yara's insane behavior, as well as your letters, have recently made me suspect that more was happening than I was able to see. 
If I'm right, if this population can no longer be controlled either by the Mark Glavneys or the Vera Krenas, then what? A population out of, out of control within national boundaries is like an animal in a zoo. It's caged, imprisoned by zookeepers. It isn't a free population. The military apparatus surrounding us is like the tamer of a wild beast. Freedom inside a cage is still slavery. Our acts lose their human significance. We become freaks, monkeys. Those four million soldiers are workers like ourselves. They're victims of the same repression. Yet they fail to recognize their likes inside the cage. The species' solidarity has either been blunted or removed. What they see is wild beasts out of control. Myrna's excursion didn't go far enough. Communication did take place, and in a cage larger than a circle of friends or even a factory, but still a cage. Out of control will become freedom only when there are no more cages of any size, when the free human being becomes the normal human being. Your two previous letters had given us grounds to hope that the largest of cages, the national cages, had started to be destroyed. The events those two letters described suggested that our lunacy had started to become the norm, and the very act of exchanging letters with you suggested that it was possible to communicate across the most impassable of barriers. That's why your newest letter dismays me more than the fraternal ultimatum broadcast over the radio. Your defeat reduces a struggle for life to a struggle for survival. Ever since the announcement of the ultimatum, I've sensed a certain play acting, not only at home, where I've come to expect it, but also in the carton plant. Unlike the previous occasion when tank maneuvers were announced, most, most people seem to be ignoring the announcement, acting as if the tanks weren't real. But not only the tanks, the creative explorations in which we're still engaged also seem to have lost their reality. For example, at the carton plant, quote, delegations have been leaving the plant daily without any specific purpose. There seems to be a determination to play out what is possible before the play ends. Myrna and Yara have carried this attitude to extremes. Both seem determined to realize their wildest fantasies during a moment they already know to be finite. I have a feeling that the spirit has gone out of the exploratory activities, or rather that they are now being done in an altogether different spirit. We're no longer taking steps toward the creation of a new mode of social existence. We're acting as if we were on a vacation from the old mode, as if we all knew but didn't want to remember that we would soon have to return to, quote, normal life. For a population under continued military and police occupation for 28 years, the tanks and occupation armies are, quote, normal life. The realization of desires is not part of, quote, normal life. Dreams are realized only during vacations. As if to confirm the fact that we were only on vacation, the city, the city police have already started to act as if normal times were back. While reformist politicians are publicly calling for more self-government, the police, who are now under the orders of a reformist politicians, are already acting on the principle that our fraternal allies will accept the reformists into their fraternity only if the social order remains unreformed. We had a visit from the police, or rather I did, since Myrna and Yara were visiting Yasna, only two days after the ultimatum was announced, and they no longer behaved as, it, as they had several months ago when the activity of their comrades in the political police was suspended. The police had visited us several months ago to inform us that our neighbor, Mr. Nanovo, had reported me for, for having instigated the demonstration at Yara's primary school. At that time, they apologized to me and had warned us about our neighbor. They weren't nearly as polite this time. Two officials came to the house last Saturday. They lectured to me about the fact that there was enough disorder in this society and that consequently people did not need to add to it by, quote, provocations and pranks against their own neighbors. They then told me two large snakes had been placed in Mr. Nanovo's house several months ago. Mr. Nanovo had immediately informed the police, but at that time the police were too busy to remove them. Thinking the snakes were poisonous, Mr. Nanovo moved to a hotel. The police eventually removed the snakes, but Mr. Nanovo would not return to his house until the police determined the origin of the snakes and, quote, punished the evildoers. Mr. Nanovo told them he was certain the Vocek girl and her criminal father had placed the snakes in his house. The police told me they had recently traced the snakes to the zoology faculty of the university, but had not been able to determine how the snakes had gone from there to Mr. Nanovo's house. I laughed and told them ne neither Yara nor I had access to the university's snakes. Both policemen were offended by my laughter and told me the next time snakes were found in any of my neighbor's houses, both Yara and I would be questioned, not at home, but at the police station, quote, until the matter of the snakes is cleared up once and for all. Your letter arrived last Saturday morning, about an hour before the police did. 
Yara and Myrna both rushed to Yasna's to invite her to another reading session. They hadn't seen Yasna since the three of them returned from their excursion. I read through most of your letter before lunchtime when the three joined me. Your harrowing arrest at Luisa's plant, as well as Sabina's comments about Luisa and Titus, were not in tune with the spirit in which Myrna and Yara returned from their excursion, but with the way I felt after the announcement of the ultimatum, and, partic and particularly after the unpleasant police visit about the snakes. Myrna and Yara both laughed when I recounted what the police had just told me, and Yara commented, quote, He deserved crocodiles. The police as well as the snakes are forgotten. As soon as Yasna arrives, she tells me exuberantly, Titus and I are engaged. We're going to celebrate our engagement two weeks from tomorrow, and I'm inviting all my friends. I hope by then you can talk Myrna and Yara out of their hostility toward him. I congratulate her and promise to try. Myrna plunges into your letter as soon as she's back in the house. She reads while eating lunch and excitedly passes every sheet to Yara. Soon after she starts reading, Myrna exclaims, Sabina didn't even know about the strike at my plant until her strike was over. You're talking about communication between continents, and Sophia isn't even communicating with the person right next to her. How sad. She didn't even know I was looking forward to an excursion across the sea. I wonder if she would have looked forward to seeing me. Stopping at, at a later point in her reading, she tells me, Sabina is right about that night we spent together. I'm the one who remembered it wrong. I think she could figure out why I changed it. I pretended to be Jan making love to Myrna, but I remembered was the night when Jan made love to me, because that was the most wonderful night I spent with him. Still later, she tells Yasna, You'll smile less when you read the rest of this letter. You're trying to convince yourself Titus is mean because he's so isolated. Wait until you read what he was like when he wasn't isolated. Yasna, who has also started reading your letter, is irritated by Myrna's comment. I can understand Yara's hostility toward him. It's due to Titus's misguided helpfulness in having Vesna taken to the hospital against Yara's objections. But I can't understand your hostility, Myrna, as anything more than jealousy. You loved him once, and that's the only clue I have about your behavior. I should never have told you what he said about you, Vera and Louisa. He said those things only because he's isolated, lonely, and unhappy. You know perfectly well unhappiness breeds bitterness towards other people's happiness. As soon as I got back, I described our trip to him. I told him about your strike and Yarostan's strike. I told him he was isolated, removed from the experiences taking place and the people living them. I told him his goodness was turning into bitterness. He was becoming a spiteful hermit, while I was becoming a spiteful old maid. And I told him that I was sure that together we could find our way back into the stream of life. He responded by proposing to me. Don't you see that his proposal is virtually a renunciation of what he's become? He doesn't want to be bitter and mean. He wants, to be, he wants to rejoin us as our friend. He wants to break out of his isolation. Why are you so set on destroying our happiness? Myrna says, Titus was released 20 years ago, while the rest of you stayed in jail. Zednik saw him in jail 20 years ago, I remind her. He was told his arrest had been a mistake. It was undoubtedly his release that was a mistake. Maybe they let him out just to give the Nachalos the impression that all three of us were being released. Myrna, I'm not talking about things that happened 20 years ago, Yasna pleads. I'm talking about the happiness of two living people. Titus and I need each other, and we're perfectly suited to each other. We're both equally isolated. We've both sacrificed our lives for nothing. But Myrna is unmoved. He wasn't arrested with the rest of you eight years later, either. That's surely a coincidence, I suggest. On the earlier occasion, he was temporarily released to create an impression. On the later occasion, he was arrested a few weeks later than the rest of us. That doesn't exactly make him an ogre. I don't believe in coincidences, Myrna shouts. Sophia asked why he didn't tell you about her letter when he visited you. She sent him a letter, too. And even if he didn't receive it, he certainly knew about it, because I told him it had caused your, you and Jan's arrest. Myrna, on that visit, Titus told me about Yara's birth, about Jan's disappearance, about your mother's hysteria, and your father's loss of his job, I remind her. Did you really expect him to remember to tell me about a letter none of us had even seen? Why do you want to kill the joy of two people whose lives haven't had much joy? Yasna asked her. Are you still playing that game you played on Yara when she returned from her excursion to the mountains? If you are, then I agree with Zednik. You have a morbid streak. Do you still now believe happiness can only lead to suffering and death? Or are you still determined to force me to share your burden you had to carry by yourself for so many years? I don't understand you, Myrna. When I'm miserable, you say, poor Yasna. Yet now that I'm not poor Yasna anymore, you seem set on making me miserable again. Why? Because you're both lying to yourselves, Myrna answers. Sabina asks why Yarostan is so defensive about Titus. That's what I'd like to know. Read the letter to the end, Yasna. Titus wasn't the hero you thought him. He fought in an army that killed people like Yarostan, Jan, and Yara. People like Sophia's and Sabina's friends, 
Ron, and Jose, and Sabina herself. Yasna, you're lifting a burden you'll never be able to carry. Yasna drops your letter and leaves the house shouting at Myrna. Don't bother coming to my celebration if you still feel this way two weeks from now. She slams the door. I turn angrily to Myrna. You did this to her once before when she expressed enthusiasm for one of Sophia's letters. I'm convinced she's right. Your hostility to Titus wasn't brought on by anything Yasna told you during your trip, and obviously not by what you just learned from Sophia's letter. You and Yara were already hostile to him three years ago when I was released. Even earlier. Yara's face was a mask of hatred during her last visit to me when she told me about Vesna's death. And I don't quite agree with Yasna about the justifiability of Yara's unforgiving hatred. I don't justify what Titus did with Vesna, but I'm convinced very few people, if any, would have paid attention to Yara at that moment. Yara is at least consistent. She doesn't flit from blaming Titus to blaming herself and her devil and your mother. She's blamed Titus for Vesna's death from the moment Vesna died. She still blames him. She was disappointed with me when I was released because I didn't immediately see the monstrosity of Titus's deed. That wasn't all that disappointed her, Myrna says sarcastically. As soon as you came home, she saw you had nothing in common with the Yorastan whose return Vesna had feared. Yara was disappointed because she saw that the passion with which I had frightened Vesna wasn't in you. It was in me. Yara realized Vesna's fear had been groundless. Vesna had played her game for nothing. There had been no reason for her to fear your release. Yara was disappointed, not only because you agreed with Titus, but also because you were as passionless as he. You weren't the companion I had promised her. Yara, still reading, looks up and says, as if to defend me, I didn't compare him to Mr. Zabron. Even Sabina doesn't say that. And what if she did, I ask Myrna. I was even more like Titus before that prison term than after my release, yet you didn't throw the comparison in my face then. I'm not really sure that's true, just as I'm not sure Sabina's opposite picture of me is true. During my second prison term, I reevaluated the theoretical insights that I had learned from Louisa and from Titus, and I rejected many of those insights. But I didn't reject the approach to life I had learned from them, and I think that's what Myrna is pointing out. I was theoretically committed to the overthrow of the existing social order, and it had been Titus and Louisa who had taught me to be theoretically committed. In this sense, Myrna is probably right. I was more like Titus after my release than I had been before. Earlier, I had made some kind of synthesis between my political goals and my personal desires. I've already told you Louisa and revolution were almost synonyms to me. It was precisely this synthesis that fell apart during my second prison term. After my second release, I had some kind of theory and goal, but they were no longer linked to what Myrna calls my passion. I also felt terribly isolated. I had hoped to discuss my theoretical reevaluations with Myrna and also with Titus, but at that time Myrna was in no mood to discuss anything, and after two short visits, Titus stopped coming to our house because of the cold reception he received from both Myrna and Yara. I tried to remind Myrna of that period. You're being unfair, Myrna. You weren't an ideal companion either when I returned home after eight years in prison. If anyone was bitter during those days, it wasn't Titus Zabron, but you. At that time, you blamed yourself for everything that had happened, not only to Vesna, but to me and Jan, to your father, to your mother. When did you start putting that blame on Titus? It wasn't Titus's bitterness that kept him from our house, but your and Yara's hostility. The first time he visited, a few days after my release, I returned the two books he had lent me when he visited me in prison. And that was the only courtesy of which any of us were capable. It wasn't he who was bitter during that visit, but we, all three of us. He thanked me for the books. He told us how sorry he was about Vesna's death. He was sorry the way someone is sorry about a hailstorm that destroys a year's crops, Myrna tells me. He was sorry because Vesna died, not because he felt in any way responsible for her death. He had felt responsible for her health. But the doctors were responsible for her death, not he. If he hadn't felt so responsible for her health, she might still be alive today. If you feel that way about him, why didn't you tell me at that time, I ask her. I was full of gratitude toward him. Was I a fool in Yuran Yara's eyes? I thanked him for everything he'd done for us, including his trying to save Vesna. And then I proceeded to ask him for yet another favor, while you, you and Yara simply stood by. I told him I was marked again. I was unemployable. I asked him to find me another job. Why didn't you tell me to be wary of any job Titus would find for me? On his second visit, when he came to tell us he hadn't been able to find a job for me, you made him feel completely unwanted. He didn't even look for a job for you, she says. Don't you remember what he told you? It wouldn't do your health any good to have a job right then. It also wouldn't do Yara's or my health to ha any good if you went off to work every day. We would all be healthier if you stayed home and helped Yara with the housework. He obviously knew more about our health than any of us did, just as he had known about Vesna's. When did you find all this out, Myrna? 
When did you figure out that by feeling responsible f toward our health, Titus was in fact responsible for our ills? You certainly didn't know that when I first came home, nor for at least two years after that. My opinion of you during all that time was that you were a self-repressed slave, and you didn't only repress yourself. You told Yara, stay out of trouble, don't take part in any mischief. Yara responded with, yes, mommy, and no, mommy, carrying on her mischief behind our backs, telling neither of us anything until the day she came home wearing a sign. Then she described her demonstration to me, not to you. And Yara was perfectly right. If there had ever been mischief in you, it had completely disappeared. Your view then was that mischief, passion, life could only lead to suffering and death. When your mother died, you became even quieter. Your mother had blamed you for everything that had happened. When she died, you internalized all her blame. That was the burden you've been carrying, your mother's blame. You tried to become toward Yara what your mother had been in you, a censor. Stay out of trouble, repress passion, because you'll cause Yarostan's re-arrest. You'll cause Myrna's death. You'll destroy anything you love. That's right, Yarostan. When the police came to, to the house after Yara's demonstration because Nanovo told them you had inspired it, I thought my mother had been right. I was sure the devil in me carried a sword that intended to destroy all of us. I remained convinced of that until the day when Yara told all of you there had been a devil inside Vesna too. That night Yara convinced me it wasn't the devil that had killed Vesna, but the fear of the devil. It wasn't the intrusion of the world Jan had hated, the world that makes our love impossible, Titus Zabrin's world. That killed Vesna. Yara showed me that what my mother had called the devil is what's most natural in all of us, what we feel. It's our desires and our passions. It's what we are. No sword is needed to embed the devil in us. The devil is already there. It's the removal of the devil that requires a sword. It was Zabrin and my mother, with their crystal palaces and heavens and gods, that made Vesna fear her own self, her own desires, her devil. That's what you told me before you left on your excursion, Myrna. At that time, it seemed like a fine justification for your excursion, for your strike, for your complete transformation since the day when you beat Yara for flaunting her love games. Vesna's doctor succeeded in curing you. Was it also Yara who swung you to the opposite extreme, who shifted your hatred of yourself to a hatred of Titus and Yasna? Yara, who had been listening to our argument while trying to finish your letter, objects to my accusation. I, ne I never shifted any blame to Yasna. Am I right about Titus, then? I asked Myrna. Until a few weeks ago, you blamed yourself for Vesna's death, as well as Jan's, your father's, and your mother's. You didn't dream of missing a day of work, nor of going on strike. You were opposed to the gratification of desires, not only your own, but Yara's as well. Suddenly, all the blame is on Titus Zabrin's head. All Yara can actually prove to you is that Titus took Vesna to the hospital against Yara's wishes, and we all know that. Yet what you threw in Yasna's face was the, su was the suggestion that you now blame Titus for everything. Suddenly Titus is a devil who carries a sword. I've told you it's not the devil who carries the sword, Myrna insists. It's your friend Zabrin and his friend Alberts. It's those who suppress their own devil and set out to murder it in everyone else. It's the ones building crystal palaces. The devil is in the way of such palaces. The devil loves trees and streams and sunshine. I don't think you understood Sabina's point, I tell Myrna, although I'm not sure of that even as I say it, and both Myrna and Yara are going to make me regret telling Myrna that she had misunderstood Sabina. I nevertheless go on. Sabina was talking about industrialization, not about the repression of desires. People were in Alberts' way. People are always in the way of industrial expansion. Sabina makes a great deal out of the fact that Alberts, as well as Titus, themselves, took up arms against the human beings who stood in the way of their project. Now you're telling me both Alberts and Titus had something in common with your mother, that what all of them really opposed was the realizations of one's desires, and that therefore your mother was ready to take up arms. Yarastan, Myrna shouts, I'm going to force you and Yasna to decide which side you're on, once and for all. You and your doctor, I shout back. Myrna gives her hand to Yara and says, that's right, me and my doctor. We'll show you who it is that takes up arms and why. And in the process, you'll make at least two people miserable, two people who are desperately reaching for a little happiness. One of those two isn't reaching for happiness, Myrna shouts, but I rush to the bedroom and slam the door shut, tired of hearing about Titus' supposed guilt and responsibility. Myrna spends the night in Yara's room. Myrna has already left the house when I get up the following morning. Yara has breakfast ready for me and is suspiciously friendly. Isn't it a perfect day, she asks, even though it's dark and cloudy. She acts as if she hadn't heard the previous day's argument. Myrna promised to take me on an outing today, she tells me. Just you and she, I ask. Oh no, it wouldn't be complete without you and Zednik, she says. Where does she want to take us? To the top of the mountain. 
Yara's tone tells me she's in a very mischievous mood. Are you sure she wants to take me, I ask? We're not exactly on the best of terms. Yesterday she told me I wasn't fit to be taken to the top of the mountain. I'm taking you, Yara says, and I'll show her she's wrong. She's taking Zednik. I'm not sure I'm willing to go to the top of the mountain, Yara. You have to go, she tells me, climbing on my lap and kissing my cheek. If you don't go, you'll prove I was wrong and she was right. I wouldn't want to do that, would I? You'll go then, she asks, pulling me out of my chair and throwing her arms around me. How could I turn down your invitation, Yara? I knew you weren't what she said you were, she shouts, running off to her room. A few minutes later, she returns with her dyed black hair hanging loosely over her shoulders, and she wears the slacks and jacket that had made her look like Sabina at the dance at Myrna's plant. You, you liked me like this, didn't you, Yaristan? she asked me, extremely coquettishly. I like you even better as yourself, Yara, I tell her, embarrassed by her question. I'm almost exactly as old as she was when Jan made love to her in your room. But you're not Sabina, and I'm twenty years older than I was then, Yara. Up there, years don't matter, she tells me. Unfortunately, the arrival of Myrna and Zednik prevents me from pondering the significance of Yara's last statement. Myrna and Zednik come laden with food and wine, all of which must have come from Zednik's apartment, since it's Sunday and the stores are closed. He's going. I told you he would, Yara shouts to Myrna. Wonderful, Myrna says to me. Your outing wouldn't be complete without me, I tell Myrna sarcastically. Are you bringing Titus too? Myrna turns her back to me and starts repacking the food with Zednik. Yara asks me, Why don't you talk Yasna out of marrying that awful Mr. Zabrin? And then what, Yara, I ask her, marry Yasna myself? She loves you more than she loves him. And she'd listen to you, Yara tells me. Myrna laughs, and even Zednik seems entertained by Yara's joke. You're almost as clever as your mother, Yara, I tell her. She'll make me regret that statement later. Titus and Yasna are perfectly suited to each other, and I have nothing against Titus except what he did to you and Vesna. Nothing? Yara asks. Not even after Sophia's letter? Don't you see? I only see you and Myrna jumping to far-fetched conclusions. Titus is my friend. He was my first teacher. I like him, and I admit I have much in common with him. That's what Myrna says, but I don't believe you have anything in common with him, Yara says firmly, as if she were determined to make her statement true. Please don't be like him. If the purpose of this excursion is to prove to me the villainy of Titus, then I think I'll change my mind. That's not the purpose at all, Yara shouts, embracing me again, her eyes begging. It's just that it's such a perfect day for this outing. Is it your idea that this is a perfect day for an outing? I ask Zednik. Smiling sheepishly at me, Zednik admits, It's not a perfect day at all. It looks like it's going to rain any minute. Myrna places her arms around Zednik's neck and tells him, You well know there hasn't ever been a more perfect day. Of course, at this point, I figure out that Zednik is in on the plot, but I still don't know just what the plot is. The closest I come is to suspect Myrna of wanting to get even for the previous night's argument by using Zednik to rouse my jealousy, and I'm surprised by Zednik's willingness to be used that way. You're not going to let rain stop you, are you, Zednik? I ask him sarca sarcastically. I'm not sure I know what I'm getting into. Do you? He asks me. Whatever it is, I'm looking forward to it, I tell him. Each of us carrying a basket filled with food and wine, we set out on the two-tram journey to Myrna's and Jan's former neighborhood. When we leave the end of the second tram line, we don't head toward her parents' former house, but to the clearing where Myrna took me twice before. It's still as abandoned and private as it was the last time Myrna and I came here twelve years ago. I couldn't have found it by myself. Perhaps it's so undisturbed because no one else found it either. The sky grows increasingly dark, but Myrna beams with satisfaction, sets her basket down on the ground, and stretches out on the grass as if the sun were shining. Yara throws a cloth on the ground and starts setting the food on it, as well as one after another bottle of wine. And now would the three of you mind telling me what it is we're celebrating on this cloudy and dark Sunday, I ask impatiently. We're not celebrating an event, but a place, Yara says. There's a wild, absent expression in her eyes. I've seen such an expression before, in Myrna's eyes. We're celebrating my birthplace. Long before I was born, country girls my age ran to this clearing on moonlit nights. They drank down bottles of wine and danced naked in the moonlight, until the moon stopped still in the middle of the sky at midnight. Then the devil stepped out of the dark forest and made love to every one of them. By that act, they all became sisters, and they lived only for the night of the full moon, when they returned to this clearing once a month. Are we going to have to stay until midnight, waiting for your devil? I asked her naively. They waited for that night because nothing was possible for them during the day. That single night became their only day. That full moon became their only sun. But we don't have to wait until midnight, because for us, everything is becoming possible during the daytime. 
Soon even the clouds will be gone, and we'll be able to do everything we want, and love everyone we love, in the light of the sun. You amaze me, Yara. You sound exactly like Jan, and like Sabina, I admit to her. If we hadn't been properly introduced, I would have thought those two sisters, Zednik announces after guzzling from a bottle of wine. He shows signs of being slightly drunk. Myrna sits up, helps herself to the sausages and salads, Yara displayed on the ground, and clinks a bottle of wine against Zednik's. Do you realize we failed to celebrate Sophia's success with her philosopher Pat, she asks? Imagine, a boy young enough to be her son, the same age as Sabina's daughter. And in spite of all her previous expectations, she enjoyed every minute of it. And she couldn't have staged it more perfectly if Yara had been there to help. Yet you just told me it's all over for Sophia, Zednik observes, which only proves my point, Myrna. Perpetual dancing and lovemaking may be the goal, but to reach that goal, something like a union is necessary. Myrna jumps up and pours the remainder of her bottle of wine directly over Zednik's head. This is all you'll ever get from your union, Zednik. When we get back, you can read Sophia's newest letter and see just exactly what the union did to her and to Sabina and Tissy and thousands of others who waited only to dance and make love. Trying to crawl away from the pouring wine, Zednik shouts, You don't have to prove your point that way, Myrna. How could a union have soaked those workers? In her previous letter, Sophia gave the impression that all those workers rejected the union. She was wrong, Myrna tells him. It turned out to be the majority of those workers were more committed to unions and trains, like the one you described, than you ever were. They locked themselves into windowless compartments and let themselves be driven right back to prison. If it took them to prison, it wasn't the kind of union I had in mind, Zednik objects. You obviously think your own train is the exception, but you'll see that Sabina was infinitely more honest than you are. She admitted that her own train, the one she devoted her whole life to, led nowhere except back. Tissy was the only one who knew exactly what she wanted. Zednik asks, And what was it Tissy wanted? Sabina's love. Sophia's love. The love of all the women in the world. For Tissy, the devil had the shape of a woman, a beautiful young witch, with whom she was alone in a forest by a pond, laying naked in the sun, making love. Myrna, who was on her second or third wine bottle, seems as drunk as Zednik. And how did Tissy hope to reach what she wanted? Zednik asks her. Like this, Myrna exclaims, reaching out for Yara. When Yara gets up to move toward Myrna, I notice she's drunk too. She swims toward Myrna, who pulls her down to the grass and falls on top of her. How, Zednik? Like this. It's not a train, Zednik. It's mother with daughter, sister with sister, woman with woman. Is this position not included in your, in your philosophy? The two roll on the grass so that Yara is now on top of Myrna. I couldn't accept it into my ph philosophy either. Sabina told Sophia the truth. I carried my mother inside me. I distorted one of the most precarious experiences of my life. I remembered it wrongly. I changed it so that I wouldn't offend my mother's feelings. I told myself I let Sabina make love to me only because she pretended to be my brother. I lied to myself. Saying this, she rolls over again and presses Yara Sabina to the ground. Zednik and I stare, completely fascinated, at the intoxicated mother and daughter locked in a passionate embrace. It was I who pretended to be Jan. I couldn't bear to remember it that way because I wanted to believe Jan had made love to me that night. Sabina told me Jan had showed her how he loved me. And I wanted to believe he loved me as a, as a body, the way I loved him. The only way I can make myself believe it was if I remembered that Sabina pretended to be Jan and showed me how she wanted to love me. I never knew he loved me that way until this letter came. When we'd slept together as children, the initiative had all been mine. Jan would lie perfectly still. I put my cheek on his, just like this. Then I'd slide down, undo his shirt, and kiss his chest and his stomach. He stroked my hair, but didn't ever move on top of me. It was only from Sophia's letter that I learned how free he was with Sabina and with other girls he pretended were me. If I'd known then, I would have been the one who lived in his room with him. I would have been Jan's wife's sister until they came to separate us with rifles and tanks. Yes, I lied to myself about that night. I didn't really believe Jan loved me the way I pretended he did. My dumb fascination turns to embarrassment when Myrna removes Yara's jacket and shirt and lets her lips wander from Yara's chest to her stomach. Sabina is right, Myrna continues. I did to her what I wanted Jan to do to me, what, it, what he never did to me until we were forever separated and he was forced to substitute me. And she's right. It was beautiful exactly as it happened. She slides her lips to Yara's. Every motion, every caress, every kiss I had ever dreamed of receiving from Jan I gave to Sabina, pretending she was I. I was as happy that night as I had ever been with Jan. That was all I wanted in life, the possibility to embrace those around me, all of them, to feel them, caress them, kiss them. Myrna's head dangles above Yara's stomach, and her hair sweeps across it in rhythmical strokes, like a broom. Drops of rain fall on Myrna's naked back. Yara is panting. Her hands frantically press Myrna down toward her thighs. She begs, Don't stop, Jan, Sabina, Yarostan. 
I turn my head away, confused, and I have to admit, disgusted. I, an I announce, it's starting to rain. Myrna asks sarcastically, do you hear, Sabina? It's the woman with the broom. When I turn towards her angrily, she stops her stroking motion and pulls Yara up to sitting position. I'm afraid of the look in Yara's eyes. She's drunk and stares wildly at me. Yarastan thinks it's raining, Myrna continues. We brought him with us so he'd make love to my mother, who hadn't touched a man since I'd been conceived. But he can't go through with it because it's raining. For Yarastan, the revolution means getting out of the rain, back to the safety of the carton plant, back to the meetings, back to his teachers, Louisa Nashalo and Titus Zebron. He's not at all like that, Yara objects drunkenly. I can see it in his eyes. He's not like the old woman or like that stiff Mr. Zebron. Yarastan is one of us. Myrna places Yara on all fours like an animal and pushes her toward me, telling her provocatively, Prove it, Yara. Show us that he's not like that. While Yara crawls towards me, Myrna crawls behind Zednik and pulls him to, down to the ground by his hair. Zednik lies on the ground as if he were asleep or dead. Myrna starts to unbutton Zednik's shirt and shouts to Yara, Like this, daughter with father. What could be more natural? What could be more beautiful? We're waiting, Yara. Show us who your father is like. The rain increases. Myrna, suspended over Zednik like an awning, shields his face and chest from the rain. Yara, now behind me, starts imitating Myrna, and I lose track of Myrna and Zednik. Yara pulls with all her strength, but instead of letting myself be pulled down to the ground, I place Yara on my lap and tell her, You don't know what you're doing, Yara. You're drunk. I know what I'm doing, she says drunkenly. It's the most natural thing in the world. Haven't you ever seen how freely the animals do it? Rabbits, dogs, cats play love games whenever they feel the desire. Sister plays with brother, son with mother, daughter with father, always in each other's company, without shame. Among animals, it's nothing to hide. Only people have shame. People like the old woman. People who don't have desire. And you're not like them. I don't know who I'm like, Yara. My head is swimming. Earlier you said I was as clever as Myrna, she reminds me. Were you lying? Don't you like me? I like you very much, I tell her, kissing her playfully. But Yara plunges her tongue into my mouth. Her whole body writhes. She begs hungrily. Open your mouth, father. Kiss me. Even Vesna could kiss. I turn my face away. I don't like you that way, Yara. I love you, father, she shouts, holding me with all her might. Make love to me. I can't play your game, Yara. I try to push her away. Yes, you will, Yara screams. She pushes me to the ground, tears my shirt open, and throws her naked chest on mine. You'll play my game until it's over. This is the revolution. It's right here. There's no other. I try to push her gently away from me. Yara, stop, before I... But the more I push, the more hysterical Yara becomes. Love games in every possible combination, every possible place and time. That's the revolution. You read that in Sophia's letter describing Sabina and her garage, and you toasted to Sabina and to Tissy. Why are you being such a hypocrite? Losing all my playfulness, I push Yara away from me and shout, That's enough, you hear? You're drunk. You don't know what you're doing. Shouting hysterically, I love you. Don't be Vesna. She throws herself at me and pushes me back down to the ground. You could not have felt more shocked when you found yourself under Tissy. Stop it, I command, but she has the strength of a frustrated wild animal attacking her prey. The expression on her face is completely deranged. I used all my strength to try to restrain her, to hold her at a distance, but she still reaches for me, forces herself on me, shouting, I want you, father, I want you. Suddenly I am pulled down from behind and my arms are pinned to the ground by Myrna, while my legs are pulled straight by Zednik. My violent kicks and twists prevent Yara from staying on top of me, but provoke her to keep trying. Myrna, her face upside down above mine, as drunk as Yara, tells me, This isn't right, is it, Yara Stan? It's natural, but it isn't right. What's natural is gentle. It takes place through a kiss, a caress, and an embrace. But what's right requires shouting and kicking and beating. What's right requires the broom and the gun and the tank. Yara, thrown off again, laughs, laughs as if I were playing a game with her. She dives at me again and clings to me with all her might. I shout hysterically, You've gone crazy, all three of you! I pull one of my hands away from Myrna's grasp, clench it into a fist, and swing it into the side of Yara's face. Then she flies off me, howling, covering her face with her hands. Zednik lets, lets go of my feet to examine Yara's face, and I give him a kick. I get up, shouting, if this, if this is your idea of enjoyment, then I agree with Titus. You need to be in a hospital, all three of you. I put my shirt on and start to walk away from the devil's clearing. Myrna shouts after me, My mother is watching and listening from her bed in the sky. Stop their games, she's telling you. Kill them, she's telling you. There's no other way to stop their games, their passion, their desire to live. It's not the devil who carries a sword. 
Not I, nor Yara, nor Sabina. It's she and you who carry it. It's not passion that brings destruction, but the fear of passion. Lock up the devil, she's telling you. Destroy the passion. Run from it. Or do what Vesna did. Lock yourself up. Destroy yourself.